Um, my name is Fadi Sedra. I'm one of the members of the uh, Christian Orthodox Apologetics team. Um, we've put this day together because we're so passionate about the character of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and we thought that we will be answering a few questions about him. So one of the critical questions about Jesus Christ is actually the biographies about Jesus Christ, which are the four Gospels, all right? There are f so many questions around the reliability of the four Gospels. So um, when I put my hands up to prepare this topic or to take this topic on, I didn't think that there, I would be drowning in the amount of literature about this particular uh, topic. Um, so when I started preparing it, few, uh, this talk took me a few months to uh, put it together, only because I was trying to put together in 40 minutes the amount of work that was done in the last 200 years. So you can imagine that we will be in this talk uh, scratching the surface. But I invite every one of you, and there is a slide at the end which mentions some references that I've used to prepare this talk. So if you're interested in um, delving a bit more into depth about the topic of the re reliability of the uh, New Testament and particularly the four Gospels, please do get, um, please go back to the references that I'm going to put at the end. Um, so we will be discussing today the topic of the gospel. So just to zoom out a bit about the, uh, and consider the Bible as a book. The Bible consists of 66 books. They were, they, this includes 1,189 uh, chapters. And it's written by 40 writers, 40 different writers, um, almost over uh, 1,600 years. And with that, the Bible is really, really a unique book. Um, it was investigated, scrutinized, and examined from every possible angle you can think of. You must have heard about the lower criticism or higher criticism. If you haven't, we will go through um, the higher criticism and the lower criticism quite briefly in this uh, uh, talk. But as you can imagine, this is a whole speciality in, in any university. Just and there are a few hundred PhDs done about the a part of the higher criticism or a part of the lower criticism. The lower criticism is um, um, is um, interested in textual criticism. What's meant by textual criticism? It's trying to establish the original wording or form the biblical text as penned in the original writings. So uh, we'll go through it at the end of the talk. We'll go through the textual criticism and what does that mean exactly, and I'll give you some examples. But essentially, the lower criticism is interested in trying to establish the autographs. And any, um, you know, any book which has been copied several times, it was written first, for example, the Harry Potter books. Okay, J.K. Rowling, she wrote an original copy that was then copied several times. The original copy is called the autograph, all right? So we, we know that all the books of the uh, New Testament were either dictated or written in an autograph, and then it was copied several times all through the years. So the textual criticism is interested in um, establishing the original autograph and seeing if there is any differences between the original autograph and the copies that we are holding in our hands and in our mobiles today, okay? The higher criticism started in Germany in the late 18th and the early 19th century, all right? And as you can imagine, just, you, you just have to have a background about the person who, or the persons, or the, the group of people who were leading this uh, criticism, that it was intertwined in rationalism and naturalism. At the same time, there was a huge rise and peak of naturalism and um, rationalism. It includes several, several disciplines, including something called the historical criticism. So the, um, what's historical criticism? It's in, interested into the historical setting, the date of the book, the author of the book, and the audience to which the book was addressed to. There is another discipline in the higher criticism called the literary criticism, which is interested in the genre of the book, the language or the wording, 
the source criticism is interested in the potential sources, the precursors of the text. Was this text copied from another text? Other disciplines, something called reduction criticism, tradition criticism, and the form criticism. Unfortunately, we won't have time to go through it today. Now, despite everything, all the bunches that was given to the Bible, left, right, and center, if you look at the Guinness World Record website, guess what's the best-selling book of all times? It's the Bible. So as of uh, la uh, 2021, the Bible sold 5 billion books, and the second best-selling book comes way below it, all right? Um, that said, we have to ask the question, we have to ask the question, is it possible for intelligent people nowadays to approach the Gospels as a trustworthy account for the life and the teaching of Jesus? So let's now focus on the four Gospels and see. The four Gospels have been known for nearly 20 centuries. Modern biblical scholarship investigated again every subject, every word, every angle of the four Gospels um, for more than 200 years since the uh, higher criticism uh, movement started. For the aim um, of studying them, they split the Gospels into two groups. Um, the first group is called the Synoptic Gospels, and these are uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, synoptic means seen together, synoptic, and the reason being is that they have very, they have very common narratives. So they, um, they mention the parables, the, um, the miracles, the uh, 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 birth of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the death, the resurrection, the uh, long sermons, and so on and so forth, and they are more or less um, similar. And then on the other side is St. John's Gospel, because St. John's Gospel came at a later date, as you know, and as we will discuss now, and it had a, a different nature, um, only because it was addressing a particular um, issues at this point in time. So we will find more longer discourses uh, rather than, and it doesn't mention uh, parables, not, the many, uh, not many miracles um, of uh, Jesus Christ. So we'll start with the Synoptic Gospels. In terms of authorship, we know that it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Who's Matthew? Matthew is a converted tax collector, also known as Levi, one of Jesus' 12 closest followers. So Matthew was one of the 12 apostles, okay? Mark, he's John Mark, he's a companion of Peter and Paul, but also one of the 70 disciples that were appointed by Jesus. So the tradition tells us, the Christian tradition, that uh, John Mark was one of the 70, and that his, the, um, his mom's and uh, his parents' house housed the, or hosted Jesus Christ and his disciples in the Last Supper. So the upper room was actually in John Mark's um, uh, house. And Luke was Paul's uh, associate or fellow. He's uh, Paul's beloved physician, as he mentioned in Colossian, travel companions off and on throughout the missionary travels. So what do we have um, in terms of evidence about the authorship of the Synoptic Gospels? There's a character in uh, history called uh, Papias. He was the Bishop of Herapolis in Asia Minor in the second century, so 130 to 160 AD, very close to the time of uh, writing the Gospels. His testimony is preserved in quotations by the early fourth century church historian Eusebius. So what did Papias say about the Gospel of Matthew? Matthew composed his Logia in Hebrew language and everyone translated it as they were able. You will find it in Eusebius books, um, this testimony about the Gospel of St. Matthew. St. Irenaeus from the uh, second century, he also says that St. Matthew wrote his Gospel while Peter and Paul were preaching the Gospel and founding the church in Rome. This is a very important testimony and we'll come back to it again when we talk about the date of writing the Gospels. 
Again, um, uh, Papias on the Gospel of Mark, he wrote that Mark was an interpreter of Peter. Whatever he remembered, he wrote accurately, however not in order, of the, time, of the things have been spoken or done by the Lord, for Mark neither heard the Lord or followed him, but finally, as I said, uh, was with Peter who gave him the teachings as, where, as there was need, so that Mark erred in no way. Now, this testimony, if you look at any uh, book which discusses the authorship of the Bibles, um, they put this testimony, okay? And they agree with few things, but disagree in other things. We agree that he might, uh, that St. Mark might or most probably relied on some of the sayings of St. Peter, particularly the events that, um, you know, St. Peter was from the inner circle of Jesus Christ along with John and James. So there are a few things that Peter, John, and James uh, saw that not the other P uh, apostles uh, seen. So he, he must, must have relied on St. Peter's memoirs, as we will see later, to write these uh, uh, events. But we do not agree that he has not, seen the, uh, has not seen or heard the Lord, because as I said, we know that he was one of the 70 uh, disciples appointed by Jesus, and that Jesus Christ spent a long time in the upper room, which is his, his house. That's where he lived. But we agree that he then, St. Mark, erred in no way. And also we agree with one other thing about the Gospel of St. Mark, that he did not uh, uh, write in a chronological manner, if that makes sense, that St. Mark's Gospel is not chronological. <clears throat> Justin Martyr said that Mark's gospel was based on Peter's memoirs or remembrances. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, again late second century, said that Mark wrote, the Christ, uh, wrote to the Christians in Rome at their request. They say that St. Mark was with St. Peter in Rome and that's when he was asked to write the gospel. And there is other uh, testimonies that when he wrote his gospel, St. Peter uh, uh, neither uh, agreed or disagreed with him writing the gospel. Gregory of Nazianzus about the gospel of Luke, it was incited by the Holy Spirit in the regions around Achaea or Achaea and wrote particularly to the Gentiles uh, believers. So that's um, Gregory of Nazianzus' testimony. Again, he's one of the very early fathers. So very close to the time where these Gospels were written. Now, what do we make of the early Fathers' testimonies? It's hard to believe that the oldest tradition would uniformly associate two of the Gospels to Mark and Luke without good historical reasons. Why is that? Simply because neither were otherwise viewed as a significant character in the first century Christianity. They were not one of the twelve. They were not from the inner circle of uh, Jesus Christ. Um, compare that to some of the Gnostic Gospels which came on later on in the, in the uh, next few centuries after Jesus Christ and we do not admit them as books of authority. The Gnostic Gospels, by comparison, chose well-known figures, Mary, Peter, Philip, Thomas, James, Bartholomew, and even Nicodemus because they wanted to give some authority to their uh, uh, fictitious Gospels, all right? So they chose people around Jesus Christ. But why? did the church fathers uniformly agreed that the two, two of the synoptic gospels were written by Mark and Luke simply because they were. Does that make sense? Um, Matthew was of course an apostle, however, not a respected figure of the twelve in the Jewish circles. Remember, St. Matthew wrote for, to the, he wrote his gospel to the Jews, all right? Um, he worked with the occupying enemy. He was a tax collector, and the tax collectors at that point in time were very, very hated by the Jews, all right? So why was the gospel written to the Jews ascribed to Matthew? Why? Simply because he was the one who wrote it. <laughs> we, are, we are documenting history, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Um, in terms, so that's in terms of authorship of the Gospels. In terms of dating the Gospels, when were the Synoptic Gospels um, written? 
were these authors close enough in time to be able to report the events accurately? That is the question that any historian should ask. Very logic. The closer in time we can place the composition of the Gospels to the life of Jesus, the stronger the case becomes for historical accuracy, that they are dating, that they are documenting actually things that happened at that point in time. Most scholars date Matthew, Mark, and Luke to the 60s, with Mark in late 50s. We don't know in, in terms of the year, the actual year, but most scholars put Mark's gospel the end of the 50s, and St. Luke and St. Matthew, uh, Th St. Matthew's gospel, early 60s. The more conservative views put Mark late 60s or early 70s, and Luke and Matthew, 80s to 90s. Irenaeus, back to St. Irenaeus' um, um, testimony, he said that St. Matthew's gospel was written while Peter and Paul were preaching in Rome. We know that Peter and Paul were present together in Rome in the first half of the 60s. Peter was martyred in the first half of the 60s. Paul did not reach Rome until about 60 AD. And as we will mention later, that the scholars, most of them agree that Matthew relied on Mark in terms of the few things that was written in St. Mark's Gospel, which puts Mark written, uh, as written earlier. So if St. Matthew's Gospel was written in the first half of the 60s and St. Mark is earlier, that puts it very early in the 60s or late 50s. Luke wrote Acts, which narrates the events up to the year 60. So Acts up to 62. And in Act, the first verse in Act refers to St. Luke's Gospel. Therefore, St. Luke's Gospel must have been written before 62 AD. Be it 30, 40, 50 years even after Jesus' death and resurrection, the Gospels were produced well within the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry. At that point in time, where these Gospels were written, first of all, it's very close to the events. Second of all, there would have been eyewitnesses during the time where they were written that would, come, that would say, um, well, listen, St. Matthew, by the way, you've written this story but I don't think it took place. Does that make sense? So by ancient history standards, this was a short period of time between the life of a famous individual and the biography written on about him. Let me give you, just to contrast, give you another example. Alexander the Great, 4th century BC, all right? conquered most of the ancient world. We know a lot about Alexander the Great, but where do, where do we find the story of Alexander the Great? Where were, uh, where, when were the biographers written? There's one written in, uh, by someone called Diodorus, first century BC. Another one, Quintus Curtius, first century AD. He was 300 years BC. But these two, we don't have them. These two and, in, and some other stories were included in Arians and Plotarch's um, uh, documentation or biography of Alexander the Great in the second century AD. More than 300 years between Alexander the Great and his biography was still, up until this day, the scholars consider it a very well verified and a good source about the life and the events of Alexander the Great. And then they come back and say that the biography of Jesus Christ, which were written, you know, 30, 40, 50 years after the life of Jesus Christ, is not credible. In terms of the source criticism, where did Matthew, Mark, and Luke get the stories, um, that get uh, the events that were written into their Bibles from? So what sources did the gospel writers employ to write their gospels? 
you must have heard anyone who read about this topic would hear about this, uh, would, would read this term, the synoptic problem or the synoptic problem. What's the synoptic problem? That they found so many similarities or literally interrelationship between the three synoptic gospels. There are places in two or even all three gospels that use exactly the same wording in the Greek language. All right? So, have they copied from each other? Might be. Okay. Have God inspired them? Might have inspired each author separately to use the same wording in the same event. But, we know that God's inspiration does not work in that way. God's inspiration in Christianity does not dictate words. The gospel writers acted as normal historians and biographers. They did their own homework to try to find and write out, uh, write down exactly how things went. God's inspiration does not bypass the standard process of research. Where do we find that in the gospels? We find it in Luke 1, the famous, um, the famous verses, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled amongst us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Does that make sense? Okay. So, is the synoptic problem a real problem to us? No, it's not a problem. Why? Because there are, they might have relied on each other's gospels in terms of cer documenting certain stories, but there are equally um, even more areas in St. Matthew and St. Luke's gospel which are completely different from St. Mark. Mark is the shortest gospel. Scholars believe it to be the first gospel to be written. More than 90% of the information reappears in the other two gospels. Other evidence includes the style, the syntax, the vocabulary, puts Mark as a foundational document. As I said to you, the scholars examined every single letter in every single gospel. And they reckon the vocabulary, the style of writing, and so on and so forth, puts St. Mark's gospel as the earliest gospel to be written. However, there's still so much more information in St. Matthew and St. Luke that did not appear in St. Mark. There's someone called Friedrich Schallmacher. He's one of the leaders of the higher criticism in the 18th century. He proposed that St. Mark and St. Luke used a common source called Kevela or Q. Any, again, anyone who reads in this topic will come across Q or must have heard about Q. So they said, okay, they split St. Matthew and St. Mark and St. Luke's uh, Gospels into two parts. Part which is common with St. Mark, so they must have copied it from St. Mark. And the other stories, which are not in St. Mark, they, they said, oh, they must have copied it from a different source. What's that source? They called it Kevela. Kevela in, in Germany, who knows Germany, is, is source, or short for Q. Okay, did we find Q? No. Did we find a fragment of Q? No. Do we find a mention of Q in any of the, cha of the um, uh, church father's writings? No, we don't. It's a hypothesized source that has not been found. They went an extra step and they said Q has 235 verses that is mostly Jesus' teaching. Q, for us as Christians, would have been an, another source that they've got their stories from. Well, we know that St. Matthew was one of the apostles. We know that St. Mark was one of the 70 disciples. We know that Luke made his effort to research and find out the um, eyewitnesses and the sources from which he got his, um, wrote down his gospel. So, as far as we're concerned, we're not really bothered. We say that Q, we couldn't find it. Q could be more than one document, could be more than one source. Q could be oral tradition, and we'll speak about the oral tradition. 
and a third of Matthew and half of Luke remain unaccounted for by any source. Now, let me speak quickly about oral tradition because it's very important. The contents of the Gospels are simply Jesus' teachings, parables, proverbs, sermons, long discourses, miracles, dialogues, and so on and so forth. How carefully has the word of mouth passed on the contents of the Gospels before the first sources were written down? That's a very important question. Where did we get the wording of the Sermon of the Mount, for example? Have we, have we put any embellishments by the writers? Have we made up new material? Have we gave stories, new introductions, applications and endings, and so on and so forth? A skeptic called Bart Ehrman, you must have heard of him, he likens the oral tradition to the Charles Graham of Telephone, where we start off at birth, we, uh, you know Telephone, we sit the uh, kids in a circle, and we whisper one word into uh, the first kid's ears, and then we ask them to pass it on, pass it on, pass it on, and then we ask the last kid, which word did you hear? And he says a completely different word. There is um, a, a collection of scholars called Jesus Seminar. They gather every year to decide which of Jesus' sayings that he actually said and which is factitious, and they put a grading for it or a color-coded. So, yes, they called it as um, uh, red, somewhat, not really, and then no. He must, he, he did not say this, and they decide on their own accord. And as you can imagine, for example, the Gospel of John, if you see the Jesus Seminar Gospel of John, it's mostly in black. Now, we have to delve in a slightly into how the oral tradition was passed on generations in, at that time where these Gospels were written down. So the, um, the schools were in the synagogues, all right? And the kids used to go to the synagogues to memorize the Hebrew Scripture, the Hebrew um, um, Bible, the Old Testament. They started at a very young age in memorizing the um, Old Testament, they use rhythm and chanting. The words of the Old Testament is more than 160,000 words. The words of the four Gospels is around 20,000 words. All right? So, comparatively or compar comparing the Old Testament with the Gospels, to them it was a joke, if that makes sense. They memorized all of the Old Testament in their heads that they can uh, recite. All right? Now, Jesus' teachings were revered. Jesus himself was revered as a son of God. To, the, to his apostles, he was the son of God. Okay? Do you think that they would struggle to memorize his words? Also, another method was allowed by the ancient rabbis is to take notes with a, some kind of a shorthand. And we have evidence of that happening Jesus' teaching would have been repeated dozens of times. We know that Jesus sent the apostles in pairs. They would have repeated the teachings, corrected each other so many times. So, this culture was a culture of memorization. Memorization was really, really important at that time. And it inspires a general confidence in the reliability of the gospel's tradition. So, it's not a game of telephony. Now, let's move quickly to the Gospel of St. John. Are you still with me, guys? I promise, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly done. Authorship. Irenaeus, again, in the late 2nd century, he wrote that after the first three Gospels were written, John, the disciple of our Lord, who had leaned upon his chest, did publish a Gospel during his residence in Asia. So, he mentioned not just the name John, but he mentioned, I mean, John, the disciple of the Lord. He was one of the twelve who wrote this gospel. And he was the one leaning on his chest, and we know that this is John, son of Zebedee and brother of James. Irenaeus again quoted St. John's gospel, attributed the words to John, the disciple of the Lord, elsewhere in his book. And Eusebius echoed this tradition. Eusebius confirmed this tradition. 
that the Gospel of St. John was actually written by St. John, the disciple of the Lord. From within the Gospel of St. John, scholars found that um, accurate knowledge of the Jewish customs, geography, and topography of Israel. So, it must have been John that lived at that point in time, not any later John. There are details within the stories of the Bible that only eyewitnesses could remember rather than preserved by oral tradition. In terms of date, the most ancient testimonies insisted that John lived till an old age and wrote the book of the n books of the New Testament that bear his name at the end of the first century. So most scholars agree that um, St. John's books, so St. John's Gospel, the Epistles, and Revelation were written towards the end of the first century. Eusebius cites Clement of Alexandria that John remained at Ephesus until the time of Trajan, and Trajan is AD 98, and that's when he wrote his books. Irenaeus also presents identical information, and uh, Craig Brom uh, Plumberg, remember this name, whoever wants to read about the reliability of the New Testament, this is a very, very reliable writer, argues that the additional length of time between Jesus' ministry and the writing of the Gospel of St. John explains its distinctive nature, as in it, it gave um, the Christians or the apostles some time to reflect and digest about the nature of Jesus Christ as a Son of God. It's not, it's not something easy at that point in time. He knew already what was covered in the Synoptic Gospels, and he wasn't interested in repeating them, so he wrote his own Gospel in a different manner. In terms of the context, St. John's Gospel focused on the Christology of Jesus, but also in his, on his full humanity, because at that point, there were the Gnostic threats. The, you know, the Gnosis, they, or the Gnostic threats, the, the Gnostics, they said that uh, Jesus, they, they believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but he, they said that He's only God, not human, because everything materialistic is evil. And obviously, that takes away the, 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 the Christianity in itself, as in Jesus Christ, He was a full human and a full God who was the only person prepared to take our debts on the cross. So, St. John was uh, resisting this uh, Gnostic threats. Parting of the way, that at that point in time, there were parting of the ways between Judaism and Christianity, all right, they were going into different uh, ways now towards the end of the first century, and he wanted to confirm a few things about Jesus Christ just to um, make sure that there is no confusion. And that's why he mentioned the long dialogues and discourses between Jesus Christ and the Jewish leaders. Now, another topic about the reliability of the New Testament or the Gospels is about the canon, the canon of the New Testament. What's the canon? How did the early Christians select the New Testament writings and venerated them as divine and inspired writings? Who made that decision for us and how it was made? Why didn't we include book, uh, other books or more books into the New Testament? What were the principles applied to determine the canonicity of the New Testament writings in particular or at the heart of the New Testament, the four Gospels? The word canon in Greek means measuring greed or rule. What rule was put or what measuring greed was used to determine if this book had an authority or not? The canon is a collection of uniquely authoritative books believed to be God-inspired. The most important thing that it was not a point in time, it was process that developed over the first four centuries of Christianity. And most scholars determined that the books um, that stood the test of time remained in the canon, and the books that did not stand the test of time were excluded from the canon, rather than particular people choosing books, one book over the other. It was mainly in the um, second and the fourth century AD. The, the canon was fixed in the end or the beginning, at the end of the fourth century, beginning of the fifth century AD. Um, 
the three measures that, that or the three rules that were put to determine the canonicity of a, a book in the New Testament were apostolic authority, conformity to the basic Christian beliefs and teachings, and uh, continuous acceptance and usage by the church at large. And when we say the church, there were few seats or patriarchal seats all over the Christian world at that point in time. And when we say acceptance and usage by all of these seats. So apostolic authority, either written by one of the 12 apostles or a follower of an apostle. This, has to, this was one of the uh, determining rules. Conformity to the Christian beliefs and teachings, it's congruent to the basic Christian traditions. Um, so there is nothing aberrant in these books that does not go well with the basic Christian traditions and beliefs. Continuous acceptance and usage by the church and large. Saint Asanasius wrote in one of his pastoral letters, quite late in the uh, uh, fourth century, that these are the wells of salvation, so that he who thirsts may be satisfied with the, thing, uh, with the sayings in these. Let no one add to these, let nothing be taken away. And at that point, the canon was fixed in the Eastern uh, Church, and it was fixed later on in the Western Church as well. Another important topic about the manuscripts of the New Testament are there any surviving, uh, there are no surviving originals of the New Testament. We don't have the autographs that I've mentioned in the beginning of the talk. We don't have the original writings. How can we have confidence that the New Testament we carry today resembles what was originally written? It's, an, it's not an issue unique to the Bible. Let me give you an example. Tacitus, the Roman historian who wrote the annals of the Imperial Rome about 116 AD. His first six books exist today in only one manuscript which was copied in 850 AD. And books from 11 to 16 exist in one manuscript from the 11th century. Books 7 to 10 were lost. Josephus, first century historian who wrote the Jewish Wars, we have his books in nine Greek manuscripts from the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries. How many Greek New Testament manuscripts do we have for the New Testament? Does anyone know? More than 5,000 manuscripts, ranging from fragments to a complete copy. Some of them were, we have within two generations of the writing date or the date of writing. We have so many copies that we can cross-check. We can cross-check, okay? They come from different geographical areas in the world, and they come in different languages, Latin, Syria, Coptic, Armenian, Gothic, Georgian, Ethiopic, and others. So we can cross-check, guys. Homer's Iliad, which is the second book uh, from antiquity in terms of the number of manuscripts, we have less than 650 manuscripts. Imagine the difference. They come from the 2nd and the 3rd century AD, and it was written around 800 BC. Can you see the stark difference? Uh, a, a famous example, Chester B.T. Biblica Papyri, it was discovered in 1930. It has the four Gospels, Acts, and eight letters of Paul and Revelation. And it's, it comes from the early 3rd century. And finally, textual criticism. We go back to the textual criticism. So based on the manuscripts that we have, okay, um, we have 5,000 in Greek. But do you know how many in total do we have? How many manuscripts in total do we have for the New Testament? Does anyone know? Thank you. 25,000 manuscripts for the New Testament. We are able to reconstruct the original autograph with a high degree of accuracy. And that's why, so the, the, the fact that we were able to reconstruct the original writing 
with high accuracy was the base of every single criticism that was done to the Bible. And if you deny the textual accuracy of the New Testament, then at the same point you delete any or you deny the accuracy of any of all other books that are coming from antiquity simply because they have a less number of manuscripts and the manuscripts come from a very later date from a very later date too compared to the new testament so be careful and we have a secure foundation of stable text that we could analyze this is very well accepted among the um, uh, current scholarship. Some skeptics say that there are between 200,000, 400,000 variations among all the manuscripts in all language. And then when someone hears this number, say, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. Then how can I trust this book? But obviously, these numbers were put by skeptics for a particular reason. But you have to look into the details. We have over 25,000 manuscripts, which means that we have between 8 to 16 variant per manuscript, not pre, per manuscript, sorry. So it's a very small number of um, variations in every manuscript is what I'm trying to say. But also, the majority of the differences among the manuscripts are differences in spelling. The presence or absence of a movable nu in Greek, which is the, uh, the sound n, because the, um, it doesn't make any difference um, between, in terms of meaning. But you have to understand that the Greek for centuries was written in all capital letters, without spacing between the words, without punctuation, and these errors were easily made. So the, if you read the early Greek manuscripts, there are no spacing. It's just letter, 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 with no space, no punctuation. Okay, and they are all in capitals. Very difficult, isn't it? All right, so that might create some variations, but the variations does not make any difference in the meaning. I would have loved to have time to give you some examples and how this, uh, the New Testament scholars decide on these variations. There are very few instances where the variations in spelling might have made the difference in meaning. So there is a very famous example, First Thessalonians, that we were amongst you as, um, uh, we, as babies or gentle, something like that. Okay? There's one verse that was said by St. Paul to the Thessalonians. And then, how do they decide if, if he meant gentle or babies? All right. They say that there is a rule, I'll give you a rule very quickly in the textual criticism, that they use the harder reading. So when they look at the context, first of all, there, it's, it's a huge thing. They, they look at the external sources, they look at the internal sources, and the internal sources is transcription, and it's a, it's a, it's a very complex process. But to make things uh, easy, the harder reading to them is the one that is, makes sense more or that one that they decide that St. Paul meant, if that makes sense. Anyway, external evidence analyzes the quality and the nature of the manuscripts that support one reading over the other. So when they are faced by this variation, they look, okay, let's, put, let's big, bring a big table, let's put all the manuscripts uh, that we have about this and let's look at each manuscript in particular, and say, oh, this manuscript, we know that it is coming from an earlier date, it was written closer to Jerusalem, I'm giving you example, then we might need, then the, their reading bears a lot more weight than the other manuscripts. Internal evidence try to identify the reading that best fit the meaning and the context. So it's not an easy job. If skeptics say we don't have enough evidence to reconstruct the original New Testament, we should at the same moment delete all books and documents from antiquity, as I said before. They have far less number and quality of manuscripts. The wealth and the nature of the evidence for the contents of the New Testament remains overwhelming, really overwhelming. We can now, we can know what the original text said. Yes, there are textual variants, but no orthodox, and this is, um, this was put together, this statement was put together by Bart Ehrman, 
he was one of the big skeptics. He said, no orthodox doctrine or ethical practice of Christianity depends solely on some textually disputed reading or passage. So rest assured. Okay? Now, we come to the final question. Why were these accounts written? Why were the four Gospels written? St. John in uh, chapter 20 tells us, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in Him you may have life in His name. That you may have life in His name. Jesus Christ Himself said, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The word that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. And that's why these Gospels were written, so that we can have life in Him. I give you examples. St. Anthony the Great, he was going to church one day, and as he was going into the church, entering the church, he heard this verse, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And what was St. Anthony's response to this verse. He applied it to the letter. And what was the end product of St. Anthony? Is St. Anthony the Great, the father of monasticism in the whole world, the father of all the monks in the whole world. His story started with a verse from the gospel. St. Augustine, yes, yes, Monica cried for so many years. Monica, his mom, cried for so many years. But then he says in his confessions, let us, uh, that he, at, at one night, he heard a voice saying, stand up and read, or go and read, something like that. And he opened a gospel on Romans 13, 13 to 14. And these verses said, let us walk properly as in the day, not in reverie and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. He says that this verse that he read on that night was a changing point in his life. And he became St. Augustine. We go forward a bit. This guy is Conrad. It's, um, his name is Conrad Adenauer. If you search him online, this guy was the first Germ uh, prime minister of Germany after the Second World War, where Germany was completely fractured, completely ruined. He was having a meeting with um, uh, the missionary Billy Graham. He went to Germany at that point in time. And he had a meeting with Conrad Adenauer. And he said, what hope do you have for this country? It's absolute ruins. Conrad looked at Billy Graham and he said, do you believe that Jesus Christ resurrected from the death? Uh, where did you get that story from? From the four Gospels. He said, do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? He said, yes. He said, the hope for Germany, if there is hope outside, and he said his famous word, outside of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I know of no other hope for mankind. And he used the hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ to build Germany again from the ruins to be one of the most successful countries in the whole world. Where did that come from? from the Gospels, from his belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And many more, thousands around us that we meet every day, his lives were changed by these four Gospels. How about you? Any questions? There is a lot of talk now about the Gospel of uh, St. Thomas that was found in uh, uh, Nagahamedi 
in the Nag Hammadi scrolls. You must have heard about this because Pat Ehrman sings the praises of St. Thomas's Gospel and why was it um, included in the canon. St. Thomas Gospel, we know and it was proved that it was written way after, I think in the, maybe in the third or the fourth century. We know it's a series of writings, um, a series of sayings by Jesus Christ, but even Bart Ehrman <laughs> was very skeptic because some of the things were, for example, very misogynistic, very misogynistic, <laughs> saying that um, something along the lines of, let's bring all the women to convert them into men so that they can have hope in heaven, something like that. So, um, we can talk a bit, a bit more about St. Thomas's Gospel, but um, even, even all the skeptics and all the scholars, they say can't be, um, it can't be um, a real uh, a gospel. Some of, the, some of the, I think it's just a stack of Jesus saying, some of them or most of them were copied from the synoptics, but there are other things in there that cannot be accepted. Again, I take you back to the second rule of the canon. That all, that all the sayings or all what's written there goes, is congruent or conform with the, um, conform with the general Christian basics and, and uh, basic beliefs, and it does not apply to St. Thomas's Gospel. No, it's not. It's, 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 as I said, that there are so many Gospels. There, there is St. Mary, there is uh, St. Peter's Gospel as well. St. Peter's Gospel is completely imaginary. It's, it, it's, 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 it's like it, it, that um, we can talk about it later, but it it's really talks about the resurrection of Jesus in a very, very imaginary way. Again, it was not accepted at all. But as I said, they choose the names of the well-known character around Jesus Christ just to give it some authority. All right. It's, um, if it's, because it's a Coptic, um, we found it in Nej Hammadi in, in Egypt. And if we look to say the, the canonize of the, the Bible was put by the first time by the of the Coptic Church of Egypt. So if it was, if it was valid at that time, okay, Sanasius would be the first person. Yes. We, um, but it is actually not canonized by St. Athanasius. Who is that? Coptic Pope. St. Athanasius didn't put the canon. St. Athanasius finalized, 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 finalized the, the canon. He finalized said, the list. Yes, he, he wrote at the end the, uh, of the fourth century that, guys, that's it. These are the 27 books. Do not add, do not take away. Yeah, I wanted to ask about um, the Gospel of Barnabas. Um, I've had, well, there's been some uh, speculation or well, popularity amongst a, a lot of Muslims who believe that it's it old, it predates, the Prophet it predates the Prophet Muhammad, it tells a story that's more congruent with Islamic scripture, and I've had, heard counter arguments that it's a um, fraudulent gospel, that the language is inconsistent with the language it's supposed to it purports to be in, and that some of the things that it mentions are also contradictory to the Quran. I was hoping you could provide some, you could shed some light on that and provide some clarification. Well, the, I, I don't, I haven't, um, uh, to be totally honest with you, I haven't done that much, um, uh, that much reading about the Gospel of Barnabas, but it's, de it's definitely a fraudulent, all of these are fraudulent um, uh, uh, Gospels that came at a very, very later date Okay, so a few centuries down the line, they were written by people that they, do, they cannot by any measure be an, a direct eyewitness of the, um, of the events in the uh, uh, gospel. We don't have that many manuscripts about them. Um, they were put there for a particular uh, uh, reason, maybe just to say that, oh, you know, Prophet Muhammad was mentioned in this, this or that, or this can be dated, or just to put a wrench into the relia reliability of the four Gospels. But as I said, over the first four centuries of Christianity, the process of canonicity was going from one place to the other, and the, the books um, that stood the test of time stood the test of time. Okay, the books that did not stand the test of time did not stand the test of time, if you know what I mean. Um, please, can you add yeah, more yeah. light? Yeah, it is regarding the Gospel of uh, Barnabas. Actually, it was discovered very late, 
and it was discovered about 16th, 16th, 17th century, okay? And there was no any previous copies before this. We didn't know. And even the story of discovery was something uh, hilarious, uh, that uh, someone visited, a monk visited uh, the Pope in the Vatican, and then the Pope went into sleep, and then he could uh, uh, search in his library, and then he fi found the book. Actually, this is something which is... Um, for the story, it seems like this. But the most important is the content, okay? And actually, there is a very lengthy mistakes and, and inside the very lengthy list of mistakes inside it, which contradicting with Christianity, contradicting with Islam itself. And it is very strange that uh, Muslim people are trying to rely upon it to prove them, despite there are many things contradicting Islam as well. And so we can send to you a uh, uh, list of such mistakes. One of the things which is a big proof that it was written in a very late age, that some of the measure, measuring units, uh, like uh, uh, ton and kilos and things like this, they are using measuring units which were not known before the Ottoman Empire time, which is after the 14th and 15th century. And, and so this is Part. Say, for example, if you find in the Gospel of St. Matthew talking about uh, how many dollars. Oh, there were no dollars at the time of Jesus Christ. This is actually a very late coin. The same happened. You'll find inside it many measuring units which were only started to use at the time of the Ottoman Empire, which indicates that this was at least written after the 15th century. So it is not a canonical 